I had kind of just relinquished control of a lot of, you know, where my life was going and, you know, how it was unfolding. And I didn't quite understand why I had relinquished that control. And this trip was like a, a way for me to kind of understand that and kind of take back the course of my life and, you know, set it on a direction that I really want, as opposed to just kind of letting life happen to me. Welcome back to the show. I'm Paul Schmid, the host of The Pursuit Zone, a podcast that interviews explorers from around the globe to bring you their exciting stories. These are people that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. This is episode 183 with Jacob Adaram, where we talk about his row across the Pacific Ocean. Let's start the show, and let me introduce Jacob. He is an Eagle Scout a former military aviator and an avid traveler who has explored over 35 countries. He rode a recumbent bicycle across the U.S. using the Race Across America route, and in July 2018 began rowing from Nia Bay, Washington to Australia, making landfall 11 months later at Trinity Beach, Queensland, a journey of over 7,000 statute miles in a custom-made rowboat and the longest solo, non-stop row from North America in the history of modern ocean rowing. He is also raising funds for Water Mission, a nonprofit that builds and implements safe water, sanitation, and hygiene solutions for people in developing countries and disaster areas. You can learn more about him at his website, jacobadaram.com. Jacob Adaram, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So what were you doing before you began the big ocean row? The whole process before it started took uh, several years. So uh, originally, before I was started the trip, I was in the military as a military pilot, as you mentioned. And then I got out of the military in 2014, and it took me until 2018 to actually you know, push off from the dock. So in that time, I was mainly researching, planning, and uh, I continued to fly as a pilot, uh, but as a defense contractor, basically, is what I was doing to raise the money to do it, you know. Why did you choose rowing? So rowing, yeah. I mean, it's pretty interesting. I didn't have any uh, ocean rowing or any rowing experience at all, really. I wasn't uh, on a you know college crew team or anything like that, but I knew I wanted to do something on the ocean. So I started just looking at different ways to, you know, explore on the water. And, uh, you know, there's not too many ways to get around on the ocean. And, uh, you know, sailing was uh, something that looked interesting or fun, but it didn't seem like it was, you know, something that uh, would fulfill my desire for a challenge, at least because, you know, competitive sailing is one thing, but, you know, sailing by yourself is another thing. So I wanted to do something that was, you know, physically demanding and something that uh, I still also didn't have any experience in. So at one point found the, um, found a website or an article about uh, rowing across the Atlantic Ocean, and that kind of uh, sparked my interest in it. And then I just started looking at different, you know, ocean rowing routes and uh, eventually found that uh, the route that I ended up doing hadn't been done before, at least successfully. So um, that's kind of what drew me to it. Something that was very difficult and also something that was also within my grasp of something that I could do and learn within the uh, within a few years, you know. I'm curious as to why you wanted to do a big adventure like this, especially coming as a military aviator, which I would think is a pretty exciting, kind of dangerous lifestyle. What made you want to say, you know, I, I got to do some big adventure like this, kind of some human powered adventure? It was actually it took me a while to kind of actually figure out why I was doing it in the first place. I told myself and I told others, you know, as I was starting the process that, you know, I just wanted to learn more about myself. I want to learn more about the world. You know, I want to push myself. I want to test my boundaries. You know, all those things are true, uh, but it wasn't really quite getting at the the root of the of the issue. And it took actually doing it to kind of figure it out. And one of the things that I had, you know, learned was that I had kind of just relinquished control of a lot of, you know, where my life was going and, you know, how it was unfolding. And I didn't quite understand why I had relinquished that control. 
and this trip was like a, a way for me to kind of understand that and kind of take back the course of my life and, you know, set it on a direction that I really want, as opposed to just kind of letting life happen to me. You set your sights on the Pacific, I think, because you mentioned the distance um, was attractive to you and that no one had done that distance. Um, but then, then how do you go about learning about all that you need to learn about rowing? It was basically just a lot of reading, a lot of research. And then I reached out to several other, other ocean rowers and tried to get advice from them as well. That worked somewhat, and that, some people were kind of reluctant to kind of talk to me. Um, but sorry, sorry to interrupt. But why? Why? Do you, why is that? They don't want to give up secrets, or what? It, yeah, I don't know what it was. It was. I think it was mainly just like um, maybe. I don't think it was secrets. I think it was more like they thought I was threatening their position in the ocean rowing community or something like that. I, that's the kind of the vibe I got out of it, mm. but you know, who knows? I mean, it could be any, any reason. Obviously I don't know them personally, so I can't really judge, you know, why they don't want to talk to me. Maybe it was me. Maybe it was the way that I was approaching them. Maybe I did it all wrong. I don't know for sure. But, um, either way I, I ended up talking to, let's see, probably three different, uh, previous ocean rowers, which was, uh, you know, you get little bits and pieces here and there that, you know, it definitely help. And it kind of gives you an idea of where your knowledge is maybe a little bit weak. And uh, for me, it actually helped being a military aviator because there's a lot of skills that, you know, translate well from, um, you know, the aviation world to the maritime world, like navigation and weather, you know, those sort of things. So I had a decent, you know, base um, and I kind of knew what the threats would be. So I focused on the things that uh, would be most likely to cause me to fail, you know, weather being probably the number one thing in terms of, you know, trying to figure out myself and like how that, to get my body and my mind ready. That was basically just a, a, a guessing game and just trying to, you know, just guess what would be the best thing for me to do to prepare. And, and I didn't really know going into it you know, what to expect. So obviously I didn't uh, get everything right, but I got most of the things I needed enough to actually safely, safely make it across. <laughs> For the ones that gave you advice, what, what's the best piece of information that you learned from them? The biggest stuff was just practical things like how you should take care of your skin, like while you're out there and because the salt water and the salty air is just, it's going to, take its toll over time. Like, uh, there's a, a lady named Leah Ditton. She's actually trying to be the first uh, lady to row across the Pacific ocean west to east from Japan to San Francisco. And, uh, she like, she gave me advice, like, uh, for cleaning your body, just take actual spray bottles and like fill one with like fresh water and fill one with a little bit of like soapy water. That's a good way to like preserve water and also an easy application method. You know, and then how to use wet wipes, you know, that sort of thing. Like uh, Sonia Baumstein is another lady I talked to. She's up in Washington. You know, she talked about how she uses her wet wipes where she would go through maybe five or six a day and then, you know, use those to clean her body and then, um, you know, put those in later after she cleans her body, put them in a Ziploc bag and then save them uh, for you know, toilet paper later, that sort of thing. And I didn't do it exactly like that, but it got me thinking about, you know, exactly how you are you going to manage your, your resources and, you know, how can you, you know, use different items in different ways to maximize the benefit, that sort of thing. I got those kind of like tips that really, you know, helped a lot while I was out there. What, what were you most afraid of before you set out? My stomach was definitely churning definitely the night before, you know, the butterflies type feeling. And I think the biggest fear was that it would just be a complete <laughs> disaster, like leaving shore and that like I would just be found on the coast of Washington like three days later just as a complete failure. <laughs> that was probably my biggest fear. Once you get going, just like anything else in life, like what you want, once you're in it, like you realize what it is and then you just focus on actually getting it done. And all that just, you know, fades away. 
what kind of a budget do you need for something like this? And were you able to get any sponsors to help you out? Yeah, the budget was tough. You know, if you want to do it as a uh, as a custom, so I had a custom design and a custom build. So the custom design itself was just was twenty five grand just for the design, and then the build plus all the supplies and you know adding it all together with the cost of the the design was over three hundred thousand, so over three hundred fifty thousand U.S. dollars. So that's uh, it took a big chunk of my time and effort and my life really just to get that money raised and uh sponsorship wise i was able to get some in-kind support basically you know scooter creek boat works in portland oregon were the biggest help they helped but because they're the ones that built helped actually they built a boat and they helped me or actually they let me help them build the boat so i was in the build process and that was a great learning experience and then they just did a they helped me out with the cost of the boat. That was the biggest sponsor. And then, you know, after that I had just some free things like, uh, you know, supplies. I got some, uh, uh, in kind support from Soylent. They gave me some free food. I got like free, uh, help from weather routing incorporated. Uh, they gave me some weather services, you know, free sunscreen from soul sun guard. You know, I got uh, drift co is a company that gave me, uh, transportation services of my boat from Portland to Washington. And, uh, up to Nia Bay as well. So it was a, a lot of those sorts of uh, assists, but no, nobody actually gave me cash. So all the money to actually build it, I had to raise on my own. And I did that through, you know, flying as a pilot. And some of the places I flew was were kind of unpleasant. <laughs> I had to fly like in Iraq and Afghanistan to raise the money for it. But uh, it was a good way to, a quick way to make the money. So that's basically how I did it. What did you do for training? So there was the knowledge part of it, and the things that I focused on improving was my maritime base of knowledge. And so, like I had mentioned, I had a base of weather before, but it was mainly aviation-related. And so I ended up taking a, a weather course that was a maritime weather course through Star Path School of Navigation out of Seattle. And they were really cool up there as well. They they gave me quite a bit of advice when I was out on the water. The guy that runs the place, his name is David Birch. He's he's literally written books on navigation and on weather and pretty much everything maritime related that you could think of, you know, celestial navigation. So I took two courses through his school. One was maritime weather and the other one was a uh, just a, a navigation course, um, which had a lot of good tips, you know, specific to boating. And then, of course, it's just I did a lot of research on, you know, what other ocean rowers had taken with them on their trips, like just specific pieces of equipment. You know, what communication devices, what navigation equipment, you know, that sort of thing. And then in terms of my body physically, you know, I, I did hire a uh, an actual uh, personal trainer just to kind of get his take on what, you know, my body would require in that sort of environment. It really came down to, you know, a lot of core work. Obviously, rowing was a big part of that on like an, an, a rowing machine or an erg and actually just putting in the reps and the hours on the rowing machine just so that my body had, you know, some sort of muscle memory of having to do that motion frequently. And then, uh, you know, focusing on core work as well was pretty huge because, you know, on an erg, it just stays still, but out in the ocean, it's like a rowing machine that's, you know, rolling up to like 45 degrees constantly. So it's a whole different thing. And uh, it's really difficult to replicate on land. And I found that, the only thing that I was able to do to even get an idea of what that might be like was actually just go do it. So that, <laughs> that was the biggest thing. Once I got the boat built, I took it up to uh, gig Harbor, Washington. I stayed there for about six weeks and that was another sponsor. There's a uh, Marina there that uh, helped me out, Arabella's. And I stayed there for six weeks, uh, just rowing in it, but even rowing like in a Harbor with a lot of currents and that sort of thing, it was still, it was nothing like being out on the open ocean. So I ended up taking it up to Nia Bay before I left, and I spent a couple of weeks up there. And I took I took one trip from uh, Nia Bay out into the open ocean just to make sure that I at least had an idea for what it would be like, and that everything was all good with the boat. And then I and I took it back uh, to Nia Bay, knowing that I at least took it out into the open ocean once before I left, and uh, then I called it good. 
Now, the the route planning, did you begin doing that after you took this course you were talking about? Yeah, it was a, it was a, a process of looking at all the previous ocean rows and just kind of seeing where everybody had gone in the past. On top of knowing that was integrating the uh, yeah the weather knowledge because when you're rowing on the ocean, I mean you got to take into account like like global weather systems. It's not like localized weather patterns. You got to know like how the entire you know weather system operates on a global level. You know like how does how does the entire North Pacific gyre create you know currents that uh, I can use to my advantage. It was a process of looking at what other people had done, talking to how they had planned their routes, and then uh, integrating the the knowledge of the the weather as well. So it was a combined process. And I was actually pretty surprised. Like I thought like going into it that I would have like waypoints marked out along my whole route, you know, so I had targets to aim for, but I literally had no points except for, you know, like a few hundred miles ahead of me. Like, where do I want to aim right now to make the best, you know, path across the ground to take advantage of the current weather and that sort of thing. So it took, um, a lot of uh, flexibility in trying to, you know, just be aware of my environment along the way to actually develop the route as it went. And of course, I couldn't control it the, the whole way. And, you know, because you get weather systems that show up that'll just stop you in your tracks for weeks. And obviously, if you have a point planned 100 miles ahead of you and weather that's, you know, 30 knots in your face, you're not going to get there. So you got to just be patient. And that was the one of the biggest things I had to learn to accept is just patience and just letting the systems play out and, <laughs> and waiting it out, you know. Tell me a little bit more about this custom boat that you had made. Give me an idea of the dimensions and what's it like to be uh, inside this thing? Well, the boat ended up being 28 feet long or 8.534 meters, I believe, <laughs> is the conversion for your uh, non-feet listeners. Yeah, I had it custom designed by a guy named Eric Sponberg. It, it was actually pretty interesting. It was his last professional design as a naval architect. And he had always, always wanted to create a design for an ocean rowing boat. So it was a really cool way for him to end his career and for me to start my maritime world. We started with the what I wanted to accomplish. So basically, like, what what is your... What are your owner's requirements? And like, what are you trying to do with this boat? And so I told him I wanted a boat that was like, capable of storing 300. And I told him, I think at the time I told him 350 days worth of food. I had no idea what that looked like physically uh, at the time. And then I told him I wanted to be at sea nonstop. And I told him for up to, I think I told him eight to 10 months. I wanted to be at sea nonstop for that long. Well, I mean, I, add in the food for 350 days to kind of give it like some leeway on the other side. If I, if I were not to make it in 10 months, let's see, I told him I wanted it to self write. And that was one of the big design, you know, attributes that I really was adamant about. Of course, like if I get hit by broadside by a huge wave, I want to know that the, the boat is going to want to come back upright. I'm not going to be fighting the boat itself. You know, I'd read a book by uh, a French guy that had wrote across the Pacific. I'm blanking on his name right now, but he rode from uh, Japan to San Francisco. And he had like this strange, like hand pump, like ballast system in order to get his boat back upright. And I was like, nah, I just want the boat to be naturally want to come back upright. So he, you know, he came up with a design and he had all these different graphs, the computer models that showed what the boat would the stability, basically, stability graphs of what it would be like if it was upside down and like the orientation and or actually the forces required in order to stay upright and that sort of thing. So he went deep into it. And that's part of the reason why it's so expensive to get a custom design because he's taking his time to make sure it's exactly what you need. So that design process probably took at least six weeks. We went through about eight or nine iterations. And uh, even up to the ninth iteration, I was still making changes because, you know, I looked at different designs and i was trying to imagine what it would be like out there just 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 using my imagination not any you know experience from other people and all of the previous ocean rowing boats had just a completely open like rowing area like above them there's no cover or protection i had read that um 
you know, for some reason, the ocean around community is against like putting up a canvas top or that sort of thing over the, uh, the rowing area, because they think that you somehow can use that canvas as a sail, um, which is kind of a, a strange idea since like your sea anchor that you take with you is like a, basically sail material and it's like 12 foot diameter. So like you have other materials that you could use as a sail if you wanted to, uh, I guess like I, I just don't quite understand the reasoning behind that. So in order to appease those people, I decided on uh, going with like a, a hard top. So like a physical hard carbon fiber top that I literally couldn't, use as a sale if I wanted to. So that was like one of the last changes I made. And it was one of the best changes I made too, because that, that protection is so huge out there. You know, just the, the equatorial sun for, you know, 12 straight hours is just brutal. And that coverage, you know, especially in midday, was so key. Because, uh, I mean, I'm just out there for a year of my life. And uh, that shade definitely helped. So just thinking about literally just putting myself in my mind and like, trying to imagine what it would be like and, you know, considering different design characteristics. We just going back and forth with uh, Eric on that really uh, kind of put it all together. And then during the build process as well, like I had zero ocean going experience before I started this. Like I wasn't a sailor. Uh, like I said, I didn't have any rowing experience. I'd, I'd never crossed an ocean before. Like I'd been on a cruise liner and that's about it. So I had zero experience in this. So as the the design came through and I started talking to different boat builders and especially the guys at Schooner Creek Boatworks. They had their insight because all those guys are sailors as well. And they just love the, you know, anything maritime boating related. And uh, they had practical hands-on experience on what it would be like out there. And I used that knowledge as well to kind of make decisions along the way that uh, deviated a little bit from the, the actual, the architectural drawings the actual outcome of the boat was not exactly according to the design drawings. And that was partly money related and also partly just practical hands-on kind of knowledge related as well. So obviously the Eric is a naval architect. Uh, so he has sailing experience as well, but, you know, just talking to a bunch of different sailors along the way, kind of refined the design as I went, it was a pretty cool process and I learned tons along the way. And that was part of the, what I wanted to do is learn about a whole different field of knowledge. And that was a huge part of it, the design process and the build process and just kind of understanding how custom boats get put together. And it was a really cool experience. I think on the top of this covering that covers you when you're rowing, you had solar panels. How did those, how did the solar system work out? Adding that, coverage over the rowing because like the original design drawings like i said it was like the ninth iteration where we finally added that so when i finally added that it added tons of space to put more solar panels which is pretty cool so solar panels covered the entire top of the boat any place where we could find a flat surface a solar panel went on there and ended up adding up to close to 600 watts of power at uh, peak efficiency you know with sun directly overhead clear skies that sort of thing and uh, it was more than enough power. Those solar panels powered uh, three deep cycle marine batteries. Those came from, they were Firefly Oasis batteries. Yeah, those solar panels charged those batteries. And then my, all the stuff on board was powered from the batteries that were on the boat. Yeah, those solar panels yeah, were pretty solid. They were like the semi-flexible kind. So they bent a little bit and they like were flush with the the shape of the boat so I could kind of I could crawl around and walk on top of them if I needed to and they held up remarkably well over that that year the biggest issue I had with them was like there's a clear film that goes over the top of the solar panels a plastic film and that film layer started getting peeled off on some of them and then one of the solar panels you know got just too hot and started boiling and burned up a little bit uh, so, but they held up pretty well and they powered everything fine. So like the water maker on board is the biggest draw, like amperage wise, it required about nine amps of power. And if the sun was out directly overhead, I could turn on my water maker and still get positive amperage into the battery. So it was definitely plenty. Yeah, it was a pretty awesome system. And the guys at Schooner Creek wired it like perfectly so that it was like a nice, easy plug and play kind of system. And everything was kind of independent so that if something went wrong electrically, I could isolate it fairly easily. 
And luckily, I didn't have to do that too much. Like I did have some uh, water intrusion problems that caused electrical problems. But even with that, the system held up just fine. It was, yeah, it was pretty solid. So where do you uh, sleep and eat and take shelter on the boat? Everything living-wise, it was in the forward cabin or the bow cabin of the boat. It was a taller one. If you look at pictures of the boat, the forward cabin has is a little bit taller than the aft cabin, but it kind of blends together with that uh, hard top. Uh, so the forward cabin is where I slept. It's where I cooked. It's where I, you know, I did everything I needed to to survive, really. The aft cabin I used mainly just for storage, food and supplies and, you know, spare equipment and that sort of thing. And that's where the the steering, you know, mechanisms and all that is in the aft cabin. Yeah. And then, of course, the center open area is just that's where I would row and I would chill out out there as well if I could when I had time, if I needed to rest and the the weather was calm enough, I could sit outside and not get soaked by waves all the time. That's one thing with the design of the boat, the rolling of it. So, you know, longitudinally, the access, it, was, it rolled rel- relatively easily, I think, compared to other boats. So most other ocean rowing boats that I saw, the design wise, it, had, it was more of a flat bottom. Bottom of my boat is more of a wine shaped glass, like sailing kind of hull. So it rolled a little bit more easily than I would have liked overall. So the waves easily went over the gunnel and just, you know, crashed into the wrong area pretty frequently. And like the edge of the gunnel would go underwater almost daily, it seemed. Maybe not daily, like at least half of a week. It, the waves would be big enough where like the gunnels were underwater. So obviously when that's happening, it's not pleasant to just to sit outside and just get waves on you constantly. So like I... The whole time I was just trying to keep my body clean of, of salt water because as soon as you get salt water on there and you don't clean it off, things start getting pretty nasty for your skin if you don't take care of it pretty quickly. What systems do you have to get that water out of the boat? Yeah, that's one of the pieces of equipment that uh, were a problem. I think the number one issue I had with the, the design of the boat and just overall just daily life on the boat was keeping water out. Yeah, it was tough. I had a a manual bilge pump. It was a whale gusher that worked great, but using it constantly all day, every day, that thing eventually just the the rubber baffle um, eventually just got cracked and just started leaking. And obviously, if there's a leak, the suction doesn't no longer exist, and you can't pump. Luckily, that only happened. That happened within the last month. After that, it was just buckets and sponges. It was such a huge pain uh, to deal with that, and then cleaning out all that water. And also the hatches that were outside as well, those hatches or custom hatches. And I just did not give enough credence or I would, I I, I don't know the right word, but I definitely should have paid more attention to keeping those hatches completely watertight and they were not at all watertight. I did not anticipate the large quantity of ocean waves that would be on top of those hatches and it, it was just water getting into those constantly and just trying to keep the water out of that was the bane of my existence for pretty much the entire trip because they were filled with food. And like that food, it was all vacuum sealed, of course, but the vacuum seals did not hold up entirely for the your 100 percent. So some of those vacuum seals failed. So I mean, some of my food got spoiled by the water getting into those hatches. And then, of course, in those hatches, there was like conduits for like electrical wires and also for like steering mechanisms and then those also were not 100 percent watertight and then those leaked into other hatches that ended up leaking into uh, inside of the boat so like like the water intrusion was just a huge problem for me if i were to do it again i would be a hundred percent actually i would fill the entire boat with water and let it sit there for a week and then make sure the water still doesn't get through the hatches that's how much care i would take to make sure the water doesn't get through, but I, uh, I did obviously did not do that. It had caused some big problems. It, I, it completely ruined my manual steering. So that I had two steering methods. One was uh, electrical through the, the chart plotter on the boat. And the other was like a manual steering handle where I could actually turn the rudder with a, my, like a hand lever. And that hand lever cable got swamped with so much water that it went into the cable and just rusted it to the point of seizure. Uh, so I lost half of my steering capability and water like leaked all the way in through to 
into the battery compartment. Like I just wasn't taking enough care to like inspect all the hatches as I was out there. And I completely did not expect water to go from hatch to hatch all the way into the battery compartment, but it definitely did. And, uh, it, it ruined my battery monitor gauges. So like I was able to salvage one of them, the shunts where the battery monitor gauges connect is where the, the biggest failures were. It corroded out that whole system and uh, I had spare battery monitor gauges themselves, but I did not have the, the spare shunt system where it connected. And that's where the corrosion just caused the, main, the most problems. So, you know, water intrusion was a, was a huge issue. And I know some ocean rowers have electric bilge pumps. Uh, for some reason, I was resistant to that. I don't exactly know why. I would design it in in the future where if a wave comes over, it just flows off the boat on its own accord as opposed to me having to bail it out every time. And uh, yeah, that was a a huge issue. So, I mean, most of the time, like the, (laughs) the, the boat was just swamped with water and I would just accept it and I would clean it out enough where when I was rowing, like my, my skin was not underwater and then it would fill up to the point where my, like my heels would start going underwater and then I would just start pumping it out again. And I just pumping it daily, hourly. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was tough dealing with that. Um, But, you know, you have to adapt. You get through it, you figure out a way to, you know, survive and continue on. (laughs) Are you able to contact people while you're out there? Yeah. And I, I didn't really know the best systems or devices that I could use. It's obviously satellite is the only way to communicate back on land. And a satellite internet I found is extraordinarily expensive and prohibitively expensive if you want to have any like decent connection. So uh, there were two devices I had. I had the, uh, the Garmin inReach, uh, which is a really cool device. And it's mainly it's like a you get your own phone number, basically, and you can text people as you can on land, basically, except there's just a little bit of a delay as it goes through the satellites. So that was my primary texting capability. And also you can use that to send position reports that populates on a map online, which is really cool. And it's not that expensive. But what I did not anticipate or plan for sufficiently is the – because it's a handheld device, it requires charging through a cable – and uh, what I did not anticipate is those cables themselves, the charging cables themselves getting ruined. And that ended up happening. And I pushed it so much that uh, one of the charging cables actually, as I was charging, like they got, I guess, salt got inside of the, the connector part and eventually just caused a short circuit and caught on fire. So you know, I ruined that, ruined that whole device. And so I couldn't use that anymore. And that happened about when I hit Hawaii, which is like a, not even a, it was probably a third of the way across. So that was a huge bummer for me. And then the other device I had was the uh, Iridium Go, which is a really also a pretty cool device. It, it basically turns a satellite signal into Wi-Fi that you can then use for email. And they advertise that you can use it for internet, but I found that it is not true at all. You can't use it for internet at all. Uh, it's mainly all you can use it is for text, like a, basically, uh, yeah, just text email. And if you want to wait for a while, then you could send through an actual photograph. Like I, I was able to send through pictures, um, but they were just pretty very ro- low resolution photographs. And if you look at my Instagram, you'll see like a lot of sunset pictures and that like sea life pictures. And those came through the Iridium Go. And you know, that was a really cool system as well. And that's actually how I got all my weather information while I was out there. You know, the Weather Routing Incorporated guys would send me uh, information through email. And that's how I would get my weather updates. But I also was figured out a way to download weather information on my own just using uh, FTP mail, as they call it, where you just send an email to a server with a, a certain code. And then that code, you know, corresponds to like a weather chart. And then so the, the code that you send to them automatically responds to you with like a like a JPEG or something like that, or a TIFF file of like the weather map that you're looking for. So that's how I got my weather information. I'd, I would do that a lot as well. Uh, just because it's nice just to have the raw data, you know, like surface analysis charts or like forecast charts, 
you know, the different charts that you could download. And it was a really cool way to get the big picture weather data. And of course, use that to, you know, talk to my home base. Like I would send at least one text message a day to my shore team so that they, they know I'm okay and uh, I know that I can still communicate with land. I would use the email as well for sending out like blog updates and like the blogs that you see on my website were mainly all just written from C and I would send it as an email text email to the shore, my shore team. Then, then they would put it together into an email using regular services on land and distribute it that way. So I would just send everything to them and then they would send it out to the world. So it was a, it was a pretty cool setup. So who's your shore team and what is their role? Yeah, you know, it's funny, like I was looking at hiring like professional, like shore team people, and it was just too expensive for me. Like I had spent so much already on the boat and the design uh, that I just couldn't afford that sort of service. So I ended up just putting together a, a risk management plan is what I called it, and just thought of every single scenario that I could possibly imagine and uh, developed contingency plans for those scenarios and put it in like a 30-page Word document. It was my cousin, my cousin David and his wife, Stacy. Those two people are the only, and they had zero weather routing ex- or any kind of you know boating or routing experience. So it was us together just figuring out what we need to know in order to uh, be safe out there. And uh, of course, I had lots of you know different contacts, like the guys at Schooner Creek Boat Works. If something I, if we, neither one of us knew how to handle a certain situation, like that, then they would uh, be able to call, like the weather routing guys. They could call the Schooner Creek builder, you know, the builders that put it together. They could call like, you know, different companies, like if the, my water maker stopped working for whatever reason, and I needed them to call them. Uh, and then they they did things like my taxes and that sort of thing because I was out there for well, four years. So like I gave them full responsibility of like my entire like life banking. They had like a full power of attorney. So it was obviously you, you got to have people that you trust, you know, to manage all that stuff. And it was, you know, family number one, of course. And yeah, those two were huge in, uh, in, in my support system. And, uh, you know, I, couldn't, I can't thank them enough for what they did for me out there. And it was so cool for them too, because they, they learned about a whole new world and like, you know, just like they were learning as with me as, as we went along. So it was a cool experience for them too. And my cousin David actually flew out and uh, to Australia and saw me land. So it was like a, yeah, it was a really uh, cool experience for both of us together, you know, to go through it as a team. And of course it made us, you know, closer as family too. So that was a, I'm glad we did it that way. Are you able to settle into any kind of routine uh, day to day? I struggle with that just in life in general. I could never really get a solid routine like down where like, all right, I wake up at this time and then I do this for so many hours and I eat at this time. Like I, I never got a solid routine down. And a big reason for that is just the weather, you know, because sometimes it's yeah, you just can't do what you want to do because the weather just won't allow it. Sometimes your body can't do what you want it to do. So you have to adjust for that too. You know, I got like a general kind of how does the day flow, but it never turned into like a solid, you know, schedule that it's like, you know, wake up and look at my schedule. And at, you know, 0515, I wake up and do this. I would basically wake up, eat a small snack, like a granola bar and pound like a liter of water, and then just row for like an hour just to get the day started. And I'd come back and then eat like a solid breakfast. And then uh, I'd go out and row for like generally about three hours, uh, come back, eat. And then uh, depending on how I was feeling, I would either take like a short nap, like 15, 30 minute nap, or I would just uh, get back out there and row for another three hours. So somewhere between three hour rows, there would be a nap somewhere in there. Meals, obviously, between each three-hour segment. So I would try to make it a, a three-hour segments of rowing. Sometimes I would push it to four hours. Uh, sometimes it would be an hour and a half, like if I was just feeling awful and the weather and the waves are just, you know, beating me up that day. Then I would have to cut it back a little bit, you know. And sometimes it was the sun was just beating me up so much that I would just have to, like, get away from it for, uh, you know, 30 minutes just to get out of there. 
you know, the waves, sometimes it just bother me so much that I would just have to just like get inside and just get out of the wet for a while. Generally, I would try to have at least three, three hour rowing segments. I would eat between all of those. And then I would try to take at least one nap in there somewhere. At night, it was tricky because uh, like I was saying, the boat rolled so much that if it's a, a dark night, like an overcast skies and there's no moon, like you can't, you literally can't see the waves. So it's like a very, it can be dangerous. And like you could get hit by something unexpected and just get thrown off your boat. I would generally let the weather tell me what kind of rowing I would do at night. Even a moonless night with stars is plenty of light. Like the amount of light that comes out of those stars is just incredible. Uh, any moon out there, of course, it's plenty bright. Uh, but unless it's a thick overcast night, Sometimes I wouldn't row at all at night. If the waves were high and it was overcast and dark, it's like, nope, I'm not going to be out there at all for that. Uh, just because it gets freaky out there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, it gets weird. So I would try to row for uh, or sleep for four hours and then get up, assess, row for a while, and then come back in and uh, sleep for four more hours. So I tried to get eight hours a night. Because, you know, I was out there for almost a whole year. And, I, you know, soon if you, you know, get behind on sleep, it's really terrible for your body. So I was really, I tried to pay close attention to how much sleep I got. Yeah, trying to get eight was important to me. And, of course, it was sometimes it was really hard to sleep because, like, if your boat is rolling 60 degrees, it's like trying to get asleep in that. It can be tough, man. So it's like trying to find the right body position. And so I had never been like a like a belly sleeper like lying on your belly to sleep, but that's what I had to do. Or, or like, I'm not really a bad, like I generally like try to sleep on my side, kind of angled a little bit, but that you can't lay on your side and sleep, expect to sleep out there because you're just going to roll over because of the waves. For me, what I ended up doing is like trying to find like a, a stomach position where like one of my legs was angled, like a little triangle and one of my arms was out as a triangle. And then I would alternate between sides that way and uh i was able to figure out a way to get decent sleep and of course if you're rowing for 12 hours in a day it's like your body just shuts down almost instantly like if <laughs> if you can get comfortable getting comfortable is the hard part so the routine was tough it was really tough for me but i got into a general rhythm that i kind of adjusted along the way based on the conditions what did you mean when you said freaky i mean is that just like your mind playing playing tricks on you or it's the unknown really so you don't know what's going on out there if it's pitch black then your mind starts playing tricks on you and like at least for me like i just start thinking like what kind of critters or creatures are out there like what is in the waves when it flows over the boat and crashes onto me and then you can't see the waves so you just get unexpected hits that kind of mess with your body and your back and and then like uh all kinds of like weird things show up in the water. Like, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with bioluminescence? I've heard of it. The only ex exposure I had to that stuff was um, like in Hawaii, swimming into the, like in the tropical waters, like at night and the, your arm goes through the water and you get like little swirls of dots of green bioluminescent. Like, I don't know what it is, like plankton or something. There would be nights where, there would be like four or five foot diameter balls of just these flashing lightning balls of thick bioluminescent, whatever it is. And it would flash like lightning. And then you'd have like six or 12 all around your boat, just flashing. And like your oars, as you would like pull them out of the water, they're just dripping bioluminescent green drops. And you're like, what is all this crazy stuff around me? The scariest part for me, like at night, is just those waves that you can't see that might just throw you off the boat into whatever is out there. And then, you know, the the freakiest thing for me that I you know, wanted to avoid, obviously, 100 percent was getting knocked, knocked off your boat and be becoming separated from your boat at night. It's like that would just be the most terrifying way to I mean, obviously, it's game over if that happens. So, you know, just you'd have to be like attached to your boat at all times in those conditions or you're just just being completely careless with your own life if, if, <laughs> if you're at night with crazy waves trying to row and you're not attached to the boat then you're just you're 
you're being extremely careless. So, uh, all those things to start running through your head and like, how do I make sure none of those bad things happen? And if they do happen, like, how do I make sure I get back into the boat and that sort of thing? So like, that's what I mean by freaky. It's like, how do I, you know, like you kind of got to build yourself up to managing all these different variables you're not used to. And then you start taking away information, like your sight, you can't see anything. And it's like, now you got a whole, whole different world you're dealing with. And, uh, you know, anything at night where you can't see it and then you, yeah, you hear weird things. you like, oh, and it just gets, yeah, it gets strange. So and like every small little detail, like the, it becomes like, like a, a whole different, you know, signal of information that you have to process. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. Do you wear some kind of safety harness and a safety line when you're rowing? I did get a little bit careless with that in the daytime. Like I would basically look at the water. If the water flowing past me was faster than I could swim, then I would put something on. <laughs> but if it wasn't, then I started getting a little like careless with that. And I would just know that I would have to be extremely ready and to swim back to the boat if I needed to, which did happen once. But at, at night, I definitely, uh, if it, especially if I couldn't see, I would attach myself for sure. I had a, like a legit safety harness that I, I brought with me. And then I also brought a, uh, like one of those surfing, like it attached to a surfboard, one of those like ankle lines, you know, with the Velcro that wraps around your ankle. I had that as well. And that's what I would use. Like if I would go swimming out into the, into the water to like clean the hole or something, I would always attach myself with that surfing line. And I wouldn't go swimming unless, unless it was calm enough for me to keep up with the boat, of course. Yeah. And I think it also depends on your boat too. Like once you assess like the threat, it's like a, it's a, any kind of like risk analysis, you know, computation. It's like, what's the, uh, you know, the risk to benefit ratio of uh, having comfort of no harness versus uh, attaching all that stuff. And like, what's the risk of me falling out of the boat? Like, let's say I fall out of the boat and I break an arm in the process. Like, how likely would I be able to swim back to the boat and get in? And so that's one of the things I practiced, like out in the gig harbor. I jumped out of the boat and tried to get in with one arm and I haven't figured out that I was able to do it. I would say that I was not connected to the boat more often than I was connected to the boat. So I would not recommend that to other people. I would say you'd have to definitely do your own risk calculations before deciding something like that. But that's what ended up happening to me. Now, when you're rowing for say three hour stretch, what are you doing? Are you listening to music or audiobooks or are you just staring into the staring straight ahead that also varied quite a bit you know one of the things that i tried to work on was just just being at peace with just myself of course and like just being able to just be exist without you know the need for distraction and uh, that can be really challenging but uh luckily the the ocean even just rowing daily, there's no two days that were the same. Like I was amazed at the variety, like even the skies, you know, even the waves, the wildlife, you know, just the way the sun is coming through the clouds, you know, all of it just varied. So some, generally speaking, my mor my first morning row, I would do it uh, just in silence and just be at peace with whatever the environment was telling me. And then later in the day, I would generally get into podcasts or audio books. And that's, generally what I would get into. And then towards the end of the night or end of the day, I would go back to silence again. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of let it flow with whatever my, you know, my body and my mind was telling me I needed. And especially like towards the end of the day, it got to the point where I was so tired that the material that I was listening to had to change. So like any heavy, like science type podcasts or like deep introspective, like learning about yourself type podcasts, those had to be early in the day because towards the, or any like a, like an audio book, if I had to, you know, follow a narrative for a while, <laughs> those all had to be early in the day. And then towards the end of the day, I would start shifting towards like the comedy type uh, podcasts. You know, I was extremely grateful for all of that. Yeah. That ended up being a challenge. Like I, I liked listening to all that stuff on a speaker uh, so I had only had one waterproof speaker with me. And uh, eventually, again, it was the charging ports that ended up getting ruined. 
and uh, that speaker ended up breaking. So I lost that capability, which was a big bummer for me. And that happened, I don't know, maybe halfway through maybe. So after that, it was just earbuds the rest of the way, which is so much more of a pain because then you got to somehow attach the earbuds to your body and then you have to attach the earbuds to something. So I don't know, maybe I should have brought like Bluetooth headphones or something, but you know, waterproof headphones are awful, at least in audio, audio quality, at least the ones that I found. So the speaker is a way to go for sure, but speakers are also heavy. So that was another like deciding factor. Like maybe I should bring an extra speaker, but then that's just more weight to carry along. So I would have liked to have had more speaker capability, but it was earbuds the rest of the way out. <laughs> How much of a challenge was it to keep up your motivation over the, the 11 months you were out there? Getting used to life out there. So it took me about two to three weeks before my body was fully like acclimated to my environment and my diet. And that, that took a while just to get my body used to that. The motivation was just like in those first three weeks was just to uh, just make sure that I could actually function as a human and actually get out there and do what I needed to do. So the, uh, the first three weeks was tough, just acclimating. And then after those three weeks, you get to the point where it's like, all right, I'm used to this, but it's just so awful. <laughs> like, it's just that you're wet all the time. You're sweating. You're sticky. Uh, I mean, just dealing with the water, like intrusion issues. And then eventually, like you get to a point where you just have to get into a state of acceptance where it's like this, there's nothing else. Like this is your life now. And like, so once I got to the point where I just got to a state of acceptance, um, then the motivation came with it. It's like, there's no other choice. Like, this is what my life is. Like, <laughs> like if you're not out doing it, then you're just not, you're not living your life. You're just like... Once you get into that state of acceptance, for me personally, at least, that's whenever I was able to kind of get to a state where I would just just get up and do it. You know, it's like this is what I got to do. This is my life now. Of course, uh, you get those really bad days where it's just like the weather's not cooperating. You're not getting the angles you want out of the boat. You want to hold a course of like two one zero, and all you can get is one nine zero, and it's ex- crazy frustrating. You know, that's whenever the you really got to dig deep and just kind of remind yourself about that acceptance that you you know you've committed to, you know, this life, and then this is this is what it is. And uh, I don't know, it, there wasn't anything specific that I would do in order to like improve my motivation levels. Like if I would get to like a dark place, you know, mentally, like I kind of had a couple of like you know, breathing exercises and mantras that I would say to myself that would kind of re-center myself and refocus myself is always kind of coming back inward. And like, it's really powerful just focusing on your breathing and just knowing that, you know, you have everything you need in you. Learning that along the way is one of the, one of the more powerful lessons that you can kind of get out of life. I mean, you intuitively know that, and it seems like obvious and cliche that you have everything you need in you, but not until you actually, you know, actualize that in tough situations, does that become like a personal truth, you know? So during the daytime, I mean, what, what are you seeing out there for wildlife? And I'm also curious about if you are, are you seeing any like big piles of garbage or plastic out there? I did see some garbage out there. I didn't see a lot. Like I saw, you know, you do see a lot of like fishing lines, bundled up balls of fishing nets. That stuff is kind of a bummer to see. It's less, like, you know, you see styrofoam bottle or styrofoam like stuff, ice chests that have been broken apart. You see plastic bottles around there, but it was much more infrequent than I thought it would be. Would be. You know, the great, Pacific garbage patch that people talk about. That was like, that's mainly like microplastics that have dissolved into like globs, like a plastic that you can hardly see. So I didn't, see, I was pleasantly surprised that it was mainly just pure deep ocean blue most of the time. But wildlife, I was pleasantly surprised to see the intense amount of ocean life out there and the activity, especially birds. Like there were so many birds and they were out there. I don't think there was a day that went by that I didn't see a bird. And uh, like you, I would be like 500 miles from land and I would see like a bird with like a beak to tail. It was like eight inches long. It's like this tiny little thing. Like you're just out there like 
grabbing plankton out of waves and then sleeping on the water. These things are crazy. It's so cool to see all those. And of course, you got the bigger, bigger birds like the uh, boobies and like the frigates and those sort of birds. And those things were awesome to see as well. And like, like you got to the point where you could just like you could you could detect the hunting pad, like what kind of bird it is based on the hunting tactics it used. And it was so cool to see all that. Like you would see birds like dive into the water and then just pop out with a fish in its beak. It's like, man, it is intense. And then of course, uh, the, the sea creatures were pretty awesome too. you know, swimming with like a, a sunfish, you know, those big old weird looking fish that have the fins like on the top and the bottom, those things. I saw whale sharks. I saw actual like sharks themselves. I saw some whales, you know, of course there's fish swimming all around all kinds of different fish and it, it was cool to see the, the the changes as you as i went from like temperate climates up in washington through the tropics and like seeing the, the changes in those uh, fish yeah the sharks were interesting like obviously i didn't want to swim with any of the sharks once i hit the tropics like i just started having sharks following me like like it seemed like daily they were just there just following me along like a four or five sometimes six but I felt like they they were just like the same sharks following me. It was weird. Like I, I thought I detected them like as small babies, like and then growing and then just becoming like big eight foot sharks towards the end. But maybe it was different sharks. I don't know. I thought it was the same sharks. And uh, so the only time I would go swimming is whenever they weren't around. And uh, it was a pretty infrequent that those things were not around. So I saw all kinds of like sea turtles. Those were cool to see. Um, I didn't see too many sea turtles. But they looked really mean, the ones I did see. It wasn't like those Disney, like, you know, Nemo-type sea turtles. There were some vicious-looking ones. And then, of course, you're dealing with all kinds of growth on your boat, barnacles and things. And those things are such a pain to deal with, trying to clean those off all the time. It's amazing how quickly those things grow back. So, yeah, lots of cool sea creatures out there. And that was more than expected, and I was pleasantly surprised. And, of course... You know, just the skies themselves are just so intense. Like the sunsets, probably my favorite thing I saw, like of the day, every day. Well, maybe not every day, but most days I was able to stop and just give myself 15, 20 minutes just to observe the, you know, environment as the sun was setting. And it's probably my favorite time of day. And like just the sunsets were just so beautiful, intense, amazing colors, like the pastels that show up. You just see so many amazing shades of pinks and purples and reds. And, oh, man, it's incredible. And that was probably my favorite thing. In my notes here, day 313, big wave. Was was that the toughest day for you? Probably. Yeah, that's probably. It pushed, it tested my patience probably the most. During... A tropical storm that developed into a tropical cyclone, and it was tropical cyclone Anne uh, that hit the west co- or the east coast of Australia while I was out there. And I, I think it was transforming from a tropical storm to a cyclone as it was leaving me. The seas were pretty bad, you know, big waves. I think the forecast called for like nine to eleven foot, like steady state, like waves with the uh, squalls that you get out there within those storms. You get some crazy intense winds, 45 knots plus. It was also the peak of the bad weather happened at night uh, with thick overcast skies, of course. So it was pitch black out, so I couldn't see a thing. The only way I knew waves were coming was <laughs> just the sounds that you could hear and just kind of the, the rhythm of the, you know, the way the boat was moving through the water. You kind of get a feel for what's happening out there. And I'd say I was not rowing at this time. I tied everything up and just went inside. And uh, at one point, I was just sitting inside of the boat, just kind of riding it out. And it's raining, just crazy, crazy heavy rain, thick rain, like tropics, like cats and dogs type rain. During the middle of this, all of a sudden, like I got like silence, like the rain stopped. Like, and I was like, uh oh, that could mean one of two things. It's either the rain suddenly stopped or two, uh, there is a a gigantic wave that is between me and the rain. And that gigantic wave is about to hit me. And that's exactly what happened. A wave broke, uh, hit me almost 90 degrees broadside probably. And it was just 
extremely violent, rushing, crazy sound. And my boat got rolled almost 90 degrees. And of course, I was being lazy with the hatch. So like it was cracked open, which is not a good thing to have cracked open when your boat is 90 degrees and you're underwater. So the water just rushed inside of the boat. My, my entire bed is basically underwater. The center foot wheel, you know, just filled up with water. It hit so hard that my spare oars on the side of the boat got, you know, ripped out of the, the storage, you know, little cubby that I had on there. I basically was sitting on the side of the boat and then I was suddenly standing on the opposite side of the boat. Yeah, I hit my head pretty hard on the top. It cut my head a little bit. Eventually, the boat, as designed, rolled back up to upright slowly. When it came back upright, the boat was just you know, filled with water everywhere. There was this awful creaking sound that I'd never heard before. It was just this crazy, awful, like scary creaking sound. And I had to address it because I I thought at first that it might be something and it got wedged into like the steering mechanism or something. And that could cause some serious problems for me if I lost my rudder. So I had to get out there and assess the situation and figure out what the problem was. So that's uh, the first thing I did is, yeah, like got outside and tried to find the source of the the sound. And I I checked out the back aft compartment and everything, some stuff got thrown around, but uh, there wasn't any like binding in the steering. So that was a good sign. And then I went outside and that's when I found out that uh, the oars had basically ripped off the side of the boat. Like, so except it was half of it. So they were lashed on one side and in a compartment on the other side. And the compartment side, it ripped out of that compartment and was now dangling by the lashing. So basically the forward part of the storage area is where it came out. So the ore was now, instead of uh, being in that compartment, it was kind of twisted the lashing like almost 180 degrees so that the ore was now dangling behind the, the boat, like being dragged basically. It was only going to be a matter of time before those things were just going to fall off the boat. And I didn't want to lose my oars. And uh, so I had to get out there and try to recover those. But it was I couldn't reach them with my hands. So I had to figure out a way to kind of bring those back up and safely back and you know tie it up again. I got my, my sea anchor line. And on that sea anchor line, there's like a, a heavy metal clip on it. Um, and I basically just... I was able to wrap that the line around the oar and clip it on and kind of make a small loop. And then I just let that metal clip just kind of flow down to the bottom of the oar. And then I hand pulled it back up. Eventually, I was able to get, get them all back in, uh, back up on board. And then I just tied them off the best I could, you know, just like a temporary, you know, tie them up just so I could get back inside of the boat and then uh, clear out all the water from in there. You know, meanwhile... You know, of course, waves are still breaking like crazy all over the place. And like any time I hear like, you know, like that same like kind of weird fateful sound where the rain quiets down for a second. It's like, oh, I got to brace myself and get ready for another hit. Luckily, I didn't get another one that was quite that bad. I was eventually able to clear out all the water from the inside. I got the oars all back up and lashed in. And then I just rode out the storm for the rest of the 16 hours, whatever it was. The next day, you know, reassessed. And unfortunately, as those oars got ripped out of that little cubby on the side, it actually cracked some of them. So I lost two oars that night. That was uh, unpleasant as well. But luckily, I brought I brought eight total, uh, six like solid like uh, one piece oars, and then two of the breakdown style where you, you can put them into pieces, you know. And those were inside the boat, so those were fine. I was down to basically two good oars at that point of the regular oars. I I still had the two breakdown ones. What are the oars made of? They were wood wrapped with carbon fiber. The actual like oar shaft was perfectly fine. The weak point was the blade of the oar because that was just like small, like thinner segments of wood uh, kind of backed with carbon fiber. That's exactly where they broke is right there on the blade. So day 335, now we're, we're heading into the end here. You had 16 hours, nearly 16 hours nonstop rowing to keep yourself on course to try to make the proper landfall. What kind of happens uh, after that? And you got some sort of an escort into uh, shore. 
yeah, that was a, a rough day. And like, I wasn't, I was trying to make it into like the Cairns Harbor, like proper, you know, even with that 16 hours straight out of rowing, I just couldn't hold the course. The, the winds and the currents just got the upper hand. So when I, that night I finally was able to make, I made it to Cairns Harbor uh, that night and I anchored and I waited until the following morning because the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard, those guys were super cool. They wanted to come out and just, you know, escort me. I mean, they weren't like towing me or helping me in any way. They just wanted to kind of follow along, give me tips or anything if I needed to as I was approaching shore. And another cool part about that is they allowed four of my family members on board their boat. So uh, my dad, my sister and her husband and my cousin David all got on board the boat and uh, they met me, you know, about five miles from shore. Pulled up. Oh, I tried to pull up the anchor, but I ended up getting stuck out there. Yeah, I just disconnected from the anchor, and uh, I gave a, I gave the other end, put the other end on a float, uh, just so the other guys could deal with it. And then I just uh, started rowing for shore. And uh, of course, you know, the winds were. I, I needed easterly winds, but they were out of more out of the south than they were out of the east. And uh, just a little bit too strong. Um, again, you know, in the design thing process, I probably would have made it a little bit smaller, a little bit less windage so that I could handle a little bit stronger crosswinds. I, I adjusted my destination to uh, Half Moon Bay, a place called uh, Yorkie's Knob. As I was aiming for that, I just kept getting hit by squall after squall, wind gusts after wind gusts. And I just I was holding a course that was about 10 degrees short of what I needed which is uh, pretty frustrating. So at some point I had to decide what I was going to do. I wanted to make it to shore of my own accord. So make it unassisted, make landfall on my own accord as well. You know, hitting the beach <laughs> counts according to the record books or whatever. So instead of uh, making it to the marina itself, like actually pull into a, a harbor and up to a dock, I just said, all right, we're just going straight for the uh, go for a beach. The next beach north of Half Moon Bay was called Trinity Beach. And uh, I just adjusted my course and went straight for the beach. And that was a pretty crazy experience. It was cool to have the Coast Guard there because uh, I talked to them like, hey, this is what's happening. And uh, they were cool with it. They were going to help me get the boat off the beach afterwards, which is why it was so cool to have those guys there. Uh, so I just aimed for <clears throat> aimed for the beach. Yeah, next thing I know, the hole is scraping the bottom right there on Trinity Beach, and I'm jumping out of the boat, and my legs are not working properly. Like I was crazy. I was surprised at how how bad my sea legs were. I I mean, new sea legs were an issue, but I was uh, not ready for a, for a, you know that level of uh, <laughs> like insufficiency in how my work, legs worked. So I, I just fell down initially and was underwater um but i I was able to jump up and walk around a little bit and uh grabbed a line just to keep the boat from broaching too bad on shore one of the like uh, lifeguards there um, on trinity beach uh grabbed one of my lines and you know got on a paddle board and swam it out to the coast guard boat just dragged me off of the shore and uh, i jumped back on and as they were dragging me off the shore and then uh, they t- ended up towing me from that point. And since that, that, after, after I hit the beach, it's like game over. We did it. Uh, row complete. So they towed me after that to the Half Moon Bay at Yorkies Knot Boat Club. Uh, and those guys were really cool there. They're extremely welcoming. And uh, they, uh, get, they let me stay there for free for about a month, which is really super awesome of them. And, um, yeah, got to sh- uh, got to the – dock there and then had to deal with customs agents and then had three different uh, film cameras and news crews and then my family was there and the various spectators and you know hitting the shore was even at the beach was pretty intense too because all kinds of people came out of the woodworks and uh, a lot of them were helping me keep the boat straight by grabbing my line you can see some pictures on my social media people just you know just came out and helped out which was really cool and even there at Trinity Beach, I, I, one camera guy was asking me questions <laughs> on shore. Uh, so it was a pretty intense, like, you know, welcoming. It wasn't uh, by any means like a calm experience. There's just so many different, uh, you know, I hadn't dealt with people in 336 days. So dealing with people and then actually getting, a, getting on land again for the first time in almost a year, it's like, 
it was pretty uh, pretty bizarre, intense experience. But I think uh, I think I handled it uh, handled it all right. Well, congrats! <laughs> Made it through. Congratulations on that accomplishment, man! It's quite an accomplishment. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm glad to be be on the other side. What uh, what was your favorite part of that of landing and being on shore? You know, now that I'm, I'm talking about this, I'm going to blank on all the information. But I interviewed um, another rower, and he and a British guy, and they made a there was a documentary film about this. But there's a scene in the movie where these two guys get off the boat at the end with these huge beards, and they their families there, and then it's really emotional. And uh, I'm just wondering if, if like meeting your family was a big part of maybe your favorite part of the, that landing or what that meant to you. It was really awesome to have my family there for sure. And like just to know that they're there supporting me and that they took the time and effort to fly across the, the globe to meet me there. That was obviously a really cool part of it. But I'd say I would say like my favorite part would be when after the cameras left after the crowd had kind of dispersed and uh, it was just my family and just a few of my friends, like the, actually the Naval architect, Eric Sponberg was there and uh, the owner of Schooner Creek Boatworks, um, Kevin Flanagan, he was there with his wife, Eric and his wife and my family. When we finally were able to just sit down together and eat my first meal on land with them at that moment, I think was probably my favorite part where I was actually able to eat greens again for the first time. I was craving salad and vegetables like crazy and also uh i had a, a nice steak I ended up having two actually <laughs> so t- that uh yeah that meal i would say was probably my favorite part of the, of the of the whole landing experience after the meal i was able to stand up and just look and look at my boat from the other side and see it tied up to a dock with an australian flag in the wind so like that whole scene it was just super cool well what about the adventure are you most proud of I have a hard time giving myself, you know, credit for hardly anything. I think it's one of my things that I'm working on, like being actually being proud of who I am and what I can accomplish. That's a tough for me. But I'd say the I'd be probably the most proud of like the the resourcefulness uh, that I was able to demonstrate. There wasn't a single problem that showed up that I couldn't handle, that I couldn't figure out in some way. You know, whether it's, you know, figuring out how to tie something up in some certain way, like how to fix, you know, whatever problem showed up, you know, how to deal with whatever weather conditions, you know, how to get those oars back out of the water, like I was talking to you about, like anything that showed up, I was able to figure it out somehow. And like that kind of resourcefulness is something that I know that's within me that I can I can use in any aspect of life at any time for any problem, whether it's an adventure or just just living life. And, uh, you know, you can take that with you and, you know, know that it's there and then you can count on yourself. You know, that's probably what um, I'm most proud of. Do you have any regrets? I don't think so. No, I don't think I have any regrets. You know, there's things that I would probably do differently maybe do like a trial run longer out into the open ocean where I know waves are getting, you know, what the waves actually do to the hatches and that sort of thing. Um, but it may be like, I would change the design of the boat just slightly to make it a little bit you know, easier to deal with in high winds, you know, but I would say those are regrets. I'd say those are just things to do differently in the future. You know, I probably wish that I wouldn't have spent so much money doing it, but <laughs> Money is just money, you know, and uh, I'll figure out a way to make more in the future. It seems like whatever you need or whatever I need, it seems like it, I can figure out a way to uh, find it in the world. So, no, I don't have any regrets. You can always make more money, but you can't make more time. I love that quote. 100%. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, Jacob, and, uh, you know, I was just yeah, go ahead. Curi- sorry. I was just curious. Where is the boat right now? It actually just recently, within the last couple of weeks, uh, landed back in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's back at Schooner Creek Boatworks, where she was born. It safely made it back, um, and it's going to be there until January. And is when uh, the it's going to be in the Portland Boat Show at the Expo Center, and anybody can come and see the boat uh, at the boat show. And I will be there as well. I haven't decided exactly how much time I'm going to spend at the boat show itself, but I'll probably spend several, at least several mornings, you know, talking to people about my experience out there 
and that'll be in January this uh, coming January. And uh, after that, I don't know what's I'm going to do with the boat. I'm thinking of trying to find a museum to put it in or something like that. But um, yeah, I don't think I am going to use it for another expedition. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, no, I, no chance to sell it and recoup some cost. I, I mean, if somebody gave me a you know a good price for it, then I, I would sell it. But I just don't think anybody's going to pay the amount of money it would require for me to give it up. I think I would rather not even get any money for it and just put it in a museum and get a tax break. I think I'd rather do that than uh, sell it for something for less than in what it's worth. You know, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty cool piece of equipment and uh, it obviously got me across the largest body of water on earth and it did it remarkably well. And uh, I'm super proud of that boat, the design, and everything that went into the creation of that boat. It's such a cool, cool journey. And I don't want to—I would—I don't want to want to give it away for something uh, less than it's worth. But you know, if somebody wanted to buy it for a decent price, then I, I would consider it. But I don't know. I think a museum is is the way to go for me. We'll see. Still up in the air. You know, I, I got a lot of people to talk to, you know, between now and then, and it's going to be on display at the museum and who knows who I'll meet and who I'll talk to. We'll see what happens. You have this quote that I pulled from your blog. Do you mind if I read it? I do not mind. Go ahead. The standard model of how to live in our society just doesn't fit me. It doesn't feel right. There's a dissonance within me, a natural tendency to reject the quote, normal path and to forge something new, something unique. I still don't know what that is, so I'm seeking. I'm following a path that beckons. So did you write that before you started uh, the row? I did, yeah. Ha have you found yeah, the path? That... Oh, no way, man. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, I, I found a way to listen to myself and listen to what uh, is truly calling me. And understanding that whatever that voice is, it's extremely important to listen to it, to pay attention to it, and to follow through with you with whatever you think you need to follow through with. You know, getting back to shore and on land has been a crazy, weird experience trying to reintegrate and reconstitute myself into a human as functional in society. Obviously I gotta, you know, make a living but I also got to, you know, be true to myself and, you know, what my, what, what I need out of life, both emotionally, physically. And, uh, in the last few months I've kind of gotten into yoga and that sort of thing. So right now, literally tomorrow I'm starting a yoga teacher training course. And like, I could have never have called that back when I was a fighter pilot. That's if I would have asked myself, are you ever going to be a yoga teacher? If it would have been, of course not, that's ridiculous. But, uh, somehow, I uh, am following what my heart, my body, and my mind is calling, and uh, I'm just learning to listen to that, and that's what I'm doing now. And uh, so that brought me here to Peru, and I'm here in Peru, and I'll be here for the next month doing this yoga yoga class. And it's like, all right, that's what that's what we're doing now. I'm following that path that beckons, and that's what called me here, and I listened. So I think it's important to do that. What's next for you? That's my next question. So if you're in Cusco doing the uh, the yoga teaching, what, what what's after that? Do you have plans? I don't really. Like it's all still up in the air. You know, it's such a weird place to be. Like especially at my age. You know, I'm 40, being single with no kids, never been married. I, I pretty much gave up my career, so like I'm not you know committed to any kind of you know company or you know or the military or anything like that so like my life is literally just wide open i could do anything you know obviously my primary skill set is being a pilot so i can always go back to do that if i need money but uh i could also like once i'm done with this class i could teach yoga if i want to i could do anything it's it's a pretty amazing place to be and i'm just allowing that to just unfold as it will and not try to force anything i know i have um once i done with this uh yeah only plans i have is i'm going to jamaica in november for a friend's wedding after that i think the only thing i have scheduled is i have a speaking engagement my first one public speaking engagement 
Uh, and that'll be in LA in December. So I'm putting together my my presentation, like whatever message I'm going to put across. And, you know, putting together that message has been a lot of kind of searching through, like what kind of lessons I want to pull out of, you know, this whole journey, you know, from start to finish to where I am now and what I can pass along to others uh, that can be useful and helpful for them. And I've found that it's, uh, I've talked, I've done a few presentations just for small groups and I've found that, you know, what really resonates with people is like the, you know, the human part of it, not like how does your water maker work? You know, it's how did you handle dealing with that isolation in your personal inward journey? Like how does that unfold? And that's what people want to hear. And it can be very exposing of your, you know, your true self, your inner thoughts and feelings, emotions. And it's kind of hard to, you know, put that out there in a way that where I feel comfortable, but also gets across a message that people can take away. So I'm kind of sorting through that right now. And uh, so I got that speaking engagement. But other than that, I got I got nothing. So I, I got to I got to figure that out. <laughs> How can people contact you if they want to learn more? Yeah, anybody can go find me at jacobadoram.com. That's A-D-O-R-A-M.com. And uh, you'll find links to my you know, Instagram, Twitter, all the social stuff. And my, you, know, you can see my website and uh, pictures and blogs. All that stuff is right there in jacobadoram.com. Yeah, feel free to email. Uh, I generally respond to anybody that writes me. I don't get that much to traffic through there. So, yeah, and feel free to contact me. Well, Jacob, thank you once again for coming on the show and uh, congratulations again on the success and good luck with uh, all your future stuff in this and that speaking gig in LA. That sounds interesting. Thanks. I really appreciate it and uh, appreciate the time and uh, thanks for uh, putting me on your podcast. Looking forward to uh, seeing it out there in the world. Thanks again for listening. You can find this episode online at the pursuitzone.com slash TPZ183. That's TPZ183. The best way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share this episode with your friends. You can find subscription links at thepursuitzone.com. If you're listening on YouTube, be sure to give this a thumbs up. You can like and follow along on Facebook and Twitter. The tag is at the Pursuit Zone. If you want to write to me, you can do so at paul at thepursuitzone.com. You can also leave a voice message at speakpipe.com slash the pursuit zone. This episode was recorded on September 27th, 2019. For the show notes and more great adventure travel podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com.